If you open your Bibles to chapter 5 of Daniel, remember we said before it's not in chronological order all the way through Daniel. Last week we got Nebi's testimony, Nebuchadnezzar's, and uh, probably the greatest testimony in the whole Bible. I just love it. But tonight we're going to be looking at back at Daniel again. Uh, the week before, we were looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we saw that their faith in the Lord was solid, and tonight we're going to be looking at Daniel, and we're going to get another glimpse of his faith. And you know, the thing that just keeps amazing me is that God keeps speaking to these kings and, and showing them how great he is, but it only lasts for a short time. And then he has to show them again and again and again. They're kind of like us. Isn't that interesting? That we, we go to a Bible study, we hear something that's really great, and we go, oh, wow, that was really good. It lasts for a short time, you know, and then we kind of forget it, and we'll go and hear it again sometime later. We go, oh, wow, that was really good. You know, short-term memories. Yes, it did. Okay, chapter 5. Belshazzar, now Belshazzar, of course, is, uh, he's not, well, I won't say he's the, he's the acting king. Let's put it that way. His dad is really king, and his dad is a kind of a warrior, and his dad's off fighting uh, a battles probably with the Medes and the Persians. And, you know, Belshazzar is his kid, and his kids kind of stayed home and kind of holding down the fort. But uh, we're going to see he's lacking in a lot of areas of being a real king. Belshazzar the king, he says, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Well, you know, a thousand of his governors, his lords, his rulers, you know, people that he had that was set up. That's how big this kingdom really is. But when you hear that, and he drank wine before them. So this is like a kid and his parents are out of town for the weekend and he's going to throw a party. And you know how that always turns out, right? Well, it's not much different here. His dad's out of town, and, you know, so he's throwing this party. And so he drank wine before the thousand. And he says in ver verse 2, it says, Belshazzar. He says, while he tasted the wine, I'll bet he did, he commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar, it's actually his grandfather, had taken out of the temple which is in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. So, you know, and, and you read that here, and it's kind of like, oh, hey, by the way, let's drink out of these other vessels. No, it's more like, you know, when you read this in the Hebrew, it's more like uh, uh, he's doing this in defiance of God. The problem of it is he's had too much wine, and God has not taught him a lesson. It was his grandfather that learned the lesson about the stump, you know, the tree being cut off and the stump with the two bands around it and seven years of eating in the front yard. Now, I'm sure that he's heard all these stories and everything, but, you know, it's kind of like when you hear stories of your grandfather. You know, I used to hear my dad always talk about how they walked to school and from school and the snow was so deep they walked over the fence posts and didn't even know there was fences there. Now, I live in the same area, and I've never seen the snow that deep, so I don't know. You know, maybe, you know, it snowed more back then. I don't know. But, you know, he probably heard all the stories, but at the same time, you know, he's the third generation, and it just doesn't sink in. He's spoiled, no doubt about it. Uh, he's been raised in all this wealth and whatever. He never had to earn a, a bit of it, you know. And then when you see here that he brought these vessels and it's for his princes, his wives, that's with an S, and his concubines, that's with an S, that they might drink with him. He says in 3, he says, they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his princes' wives and his concubines drank from him. They drank wine, and this is, now listen to this, and they praised the little G gods of gold and of silver and brass of iron of wood, and of stone. Bad enough they're drinking out of these consecrated vessels that belong to the, uh, the house of the Lord, but then they start praising these little G gods as they're doing so. 
I wouldn't recommend this. God gets irritated when you do that, you know, so I would recommend this. Verse 5, it says, in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So just, I can't cut the rest of it off. I'm sorry, you'll have to make me do, believe. Just the hand and the finger is all they saw. The rest of it was probably attached, but only in the dimension that they could see in was the hand and the finger. But the rest of it was, no doubt, was still probably hooked onto it. It wasn't just a floating hand, you know. He says, then the king's countenance was changed. Now, before he was cocky, drunk, you know, like most drunks, cocky. But now it's changed, and his thoughts troubled him. Yeah, why? Well, it's like the kid getting his fingers caught in the cookie jar. He had been brought the vessels he knew he shouldn't have touched. He brought them there, and then he mocked God by letting everybody drink out of them, and then they praise these other little G-gods and whatever. All of a sudden, a hand shows up. He's in trouble, and he knew it. And he's... Yeah, when it was writing on the wall, the finger was writing into the plaster. And it troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. Now, we get the knock and knees, but when it says that his joints were loose, he literally, in the Hebrew, wet himself. That's how feared and scared he was. His knees knocked. You know, and, and I, I tell people, I say, you know, Take this real serious because a lot of people, there's a first thing, remember this. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All Christians should know that. Jesus said, don't fear man, he can only kill your body. Fear God, he can kill your body and throw your soul in hell for eternity. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. You know, that's a smart man that starts fearing the Lord here, now. Those who don't, will when they get there okay at the judgment their knees will knock their flesh will grow very weak and they're going to have problems so understand you either you do it now you fear the lord and you walk circumspectantly you walk sober you walk godly minded why because of we know god is watching the watchers are watching, and so we do that. You fear the Lord now, or you will greatly fear him later. He is a awesome, fearful God. Just the thought, the fact that he, out of his words, could create this whole universe, and then out of dirt, make a human being like you and me, we better fear the Lord. Yeah, and I mean, he's so awesome now to our fortunate he's a loving god what if he wasn't whoa make man just to punish him no he made man and then created a salvation that every human being could be saved all you have to do is yield that's it verse 7 he says, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. This is not why the finger is still right. The, hand, the finger wrote on the wall, and then it left. Okay? That's when he called in the Chaldean and the soothsayers, and the king spake, and he said unto the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing, show me this interpretation thereof, shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. You notice he said the third ruler because he's the second ruler. His dad is really the first ruler, and he's off fight. You can't give away the second because that would be his own chair. you know. But this thing about, you know, here he is. He's going to put chains, gold. It's that, still that kind of that cocky arrogance, you know. I, I'm going to make him great kind of in, in his mind. Now, understand well, we'll get to it in a minute. What was written there was really kind of interesting. But verse 8, it says, Then came in all the king's wise men. He says, but they could not read the writing. All the men. 
what was it written in? Well, you know, most people probably believe it was written in their own language. But it's, it, it's like it wasn't, it's not a whole sentence written out. It, it's kind of like if you said um, uh, valley, valley, tree, apple. And how do you interpret that? Well, somebody come along and say, well, you go through two, two valleys, you'll see a tree and they'll have apples on it. You know, you, you have to interpret what those words really mean. They couldn't interpret it. They couldn't put anything together. Now, if my job was on the line and that was my job and they, these guys, this is what they get paid to do, I would have come up with something. What's fearful is the hand that wrote it on the wall. You see, if it would just been somebody threw those four words up there and then you go, oh, yeah, this means this or that or whatever. But because there was a hand that came out of somewhere else and wrote on the wall, you didn't want to throw just anything out there. So they couldn't interpret it. You know, they, they had no idea. He says, nor could they make known the interpretation thereof. So in verse 9 it says, When the king Belshazzar greatly was troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. You know, I don't, I don't know if they if it really means here that they were astonished at the writing on the wall and they're probably wondering, how did he do that? Is this a trick or something? But then they look at him and they see the change in him and he's so scared. They know he didn't have anything to do with this. This is, this is something totally different. You know, when you, if you went to a party like that and this, when I say party, I'm being really kind here. This is an orgy. This is, this is a drunken, orgy is what it ends up really what it was meant to be the the if you went and then something like this happens you know you just leave and you don't want people to know you were there <laughs> you know what I mean kind of thing but I mean if something happened like somebody died or overdosed or drank too much and died that's what you would do but when a hand comes out of nowhere and writes on the wall where are you going to go hide? You saw it and there ain't no getting around it. And now you have to wonder, every time you go home and there's a wall, is something going to come and write on your wall? I mean, you saw that with your own eyes. That would really make you kind of fearful, wouldn't it? Hands out of nowhere. I guess it would. In verse 10, it says, Now the queen, by reason of words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. He says, There is a man in thy kingdom. He says, In whom the spirit of the holy gods, little h, little g, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the, the wisdom of the gods, little g, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpretation of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts, he says, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. He says, now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Everything is little g, everything is, you know, the lords, the gods, and the whole thing. Why? Because this is hearsay. See, I, this, is, this is the part here that I have, I see so much trouble with, and I have trouble with these kind of people, and that's the children of, of Christians, the children who have always raised, were always raised up, and, and they live by their parents' Christianity, not their own. See, there, and an example of that is, of course, Jacob. And remember when Jacob runs into the Lord, he's always talking about the, the, the God of my father, the God of my father, Abraham, the God of my father, you know, not my God, their God. See, and that's the, that's the trouble you get into sometimes with young children. If nobody stops and and somewhere in their life brings them to a place where they have to understand they have to take mom and dad's Christianity faith and make it their Christianity and faith where it's now it's my God it's not just you know 
I, I talked to some people and they say, well, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. I was, I was born and raised in this church. So you were born and raised in this church. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is when you become aware of your sins and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and forgive you for your sins and you personally add and take your name off of that cross and you bring the righteousness of God into your heart. That's what makes you a Christian, not the fact that you were born and raised in a church. Does that make sense? But so many have, uh, have, are, are there, and they're wondering why, why I don't seem to have this. When I pray, it's like it goes nowhere. And when I, you know, this relationship. And they've never come to that personal saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be so careful that we don't take for granted that people are Christians. We must bring them to a place where they have to say, I know when that day was. I drove a stake in my life. You know, one of those memory stakes that you put in your life and you go, on that day, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and forgive me for my sins. That makes you a born-again Christian. You believe in your heart, you trust in the Lord, you confess with your mouth. It says you shall be saved, Romans 10, 8, 9, 10. So, you know, here's this, here's this grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and the testimony of his grandfather obviously is not his testimony. It, and it's not the queen's testimony. The queen mother says it was, yeah, it, it, you know, your, your grandfather had this experience. But if you bring him in, he'll tell you something. Well, that, that relationship experience that, of the grandfather's is about to become his now. Now, he's going to have a choice when he's faced with it. It becomes yours. You're, you have a choice. You know, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, there's always that choice in your life. Do I make this God my God, or do I run? Do I counsel out this God? See? And, I, and in this case here, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, look, we'll look and see. You have to make your own determination on that. In verse 13, it says, When Daniel brought in, was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Art thou Daniel, who art of the children of the captivity of Judah, who the king of... My father, actually grandfather, they just don't have a word for grandfather. They brought out the jury, were brought out of jury. He says, and I have even heard of these, as in the spirit of the gods, little g is in thee, and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. He says, and now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing. It may make known unto me, he says, the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. Now, Remember, Daniel, at this point now, he's getting to be very old. He's not the young kid we talked about in the first, you know, four chapters that we, we went through. Daniel started out probably anywhere from like 16 to 17, 18 years old, somewhere in that area, and we, we got his life. And the reason I, I make a point out of that is I want you to understand something. As much as Daniel has God actually intervening in his life at times, Many, many years go by that there's no contact. You know, sometimes we as Christians, we read the Bible and we think, oh gosh, like all, every day Paul was healing somebody or every day Peter's shadow fell on somebody and they got healed. And every... No, 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 no. You have to understand, God does specific things in people's lives, but there's many days of dry season. And that dry season to us seems like a long time and, and it's it's, it's really whatever's in your heart has to carry you on. It's like, it's kind of like you eat a meal and, and the, the, the protein or whatever you get from the meal, it, it carries you on through till your next meal. And it's kind of like that in the Lord. Whatever the Lord does with you, your faith and your belief in your heart carries you on to the next time but remember this with the lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day so from heaven's perspective yeah just in a few minutes we'll be right back doing something else but in our perspective down here in time it may be years and years so don't grow weary of well-doing paul says just stand because not every day 
are you going to have an encounter with the Lord? But every day you should seek and talk to the Lord. But that doesn't mean that every day something miraculous is going to happen in your life. It's great when it does, but I just want you to, to be aware of the fact you're, you haven't fallen out of grace just because he hasn't brought you know, lightning and thunder in your life every day. Anyway, verse 16, he says, And I have heard of these things, that thou canst make interpretations and, and, and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing, he says, And make known unto me the interpretation of, Thy shall be clothed with a scarlet, and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now I love Daniel. Listen to Daniel. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. <laughs> now, I could put that more in slang of today, but it wouldn't be appropriate, okay? <laughs> Take your gifts and do with them what you please. Give thou rewards to another, otherwise I'm not interested in what you have to give me. Yet, he says, I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now, in his younger days, Daniel wouldn't have probably talked like that because it would have been fearful for his life or whatever. But like I said, Daniel's a little older now and he probably doesn't really care. You know, what, what's going to happen to me, you know. In verse 18, it says, O thou king, the most high God, give Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Now, you notice it's capital G here. You see, he says, and for the majesty in verse 19, he says that he gave him all people's nations, languages, and, and uh, they trembled and feared before him. Trembled and feared before him. Whom he would slew, he would, he would, and he who would be kept alive, he would also be set up, he says, and whom he would be put down. Otherwise, when your grandfather, he had the power Whatever he said was immediately carried out, and he had life and death in his tongue for anybody. That's who Nebuchadnezzar was. But he got that was given to him by God, and he learned to respect God for it. You know. So in verse 20 it says, But when his heart was lifted up, his mind hardened. Isn't that interesting? When his heart was lifted up, his mind hardened. You see, in your heart is where you make a decision to become a born-again Christian or not. He who believes in his heart. That's the inner man, the real man. You are a spirit who lives inside of a body and possesses a soul. And, and that, that spirit inside is the heart of man. It, it's not your the dump the dump the dump the dump heart. It's the spirit of man. It's the real man inside. But you notice that his his heart was lifted up, and then his mind. That's the playground for sin, is your mind. That's where Satan can talk to you. He can't speak to you in your heart. God can speak to you in your heart. Satan speaks to you in your mind. That's where temptations, lust, that's where you play with temptations. You know, to be tempted is not sin. To play with the temptation becomes sin, okay? But to be tempted, that's not sin. Jesus was tempted in all ways. He didn't sin. That's, that's not. It's when you take that temptation and go, oh, yeah. And you start seeing yourself in that temptation, whatever it is, and playing with it. Before long, it becomes, it plays out in your life. But his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride. And he was deposed, he says, from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Who's the they? Come on, you guys, we're in class. Come on. Watchers. The holy ones. Remember that? The watchers are the ones that made the decree. The watchers from heaven. That's, you got to you keep that separate and keep it and understand that. These watchers have a tremendous amount of power. They're given to them by God. The watchers made the decree and changed his heart from a man's heart to an animal's heart, back to a man's heart. It, it says the holy ones, angels, watchers they're called. I just, I, I make a point out of that because it might mess up your doctrine somewhere. And maybe your doctrine needs to be messed up somewhere. 
that only God is sitting up there and has that kind of power. He has given those kind of powers, obviously, to the watchers, okay? And it says, they took his glory from him. He says in 21, and he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was the, like the wild asses, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that is uh, appointed over it whomsoever he willeth. Otherwise, Belshazzar, I want you to understand something. You're really on touchy ground right here. Your grandfather learned the hard way, and now there was a hand that wrote on this wall. Did Daniel see the hand? No. He just came in and saw the wall. But you think he didn't hear about the handwriting on the wall? I bet you it was passing through the servants and out into the court and everything. You, you won't believe what just happened in there, you know. And Daniel comes in and he knows, boy, this is, you, you know, let me tell you, your grandfather learned the hard way. Obviously, you're about to learn something you don't want to learn. In 22, it says, thou son of Belshazzar, he says, has not humbled thy heart. He says, though thou knowest all this. See, all this that he just told him about his grandfather, he knew it. But he hadn't humbled his heart. <sighs> you know, you can pretend and put on a mask and have walls up and, and look like one thing. But God looks at your heart. And in the long run, your heart's going to come out. You know... <sighs> If your heart is really, really, really good, and I, I don't know how to, to put this any other way, I guess, so I'll just say it like this. If you, if you took a, a real born-again Christian man who's really had his heart for the Lord and everything else, and somehow or other you spiked his drink, you did something and whatever, and he, you know what would come out of him? Really good stuff about the Lord. See, it's when you're not in that control to control your image that you put out that the stuff out of your heart really comes out. Why is that so interesting? Jesus has taken and driven it. It doesn't say led. It says driven by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness for 40 days. No water, no bread, no food, no water. 40 days, he's about to die. He's, he's dying of thirst, and he's dying of starvation, okay? It says he hungered. That When you start to get hungry again after being on a fast that long, it's because your body is eating itself. You're, you're dying of starvation. Then Satan comes along. Then Satan tempts him, and what comes out of him? The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. Why? Because that's all that was in him. There was nothing else in him. You, you understand what I'm trying to make, point I'm trying to make? When you're a born-again Christian filled with the Word of God, that's why we have what we call early church martyrs. They tried to get them to recant or say something different, and they couldn't because out of their heart, when they were tortured and brought to the very end of their lives, only came out what was in it. And they had to kill them to get them to silence. You know, because it was what was in their heart was coming out. Okay? So this is real important when it says, Thou has not, he says, humble thy heart. He says, though thou knowest all this. Well, then the question comes up, have we humbled our heart? See, because it's by the heart you believe God looks upon the heart of man. Man looks upon the outside, we're told by Samuel. But so that we, under, we understand that, but your heart, where's your heart at? That's why David says, Lord, search me. Search my heart. And if you find anything that needs to be fixed, let's fix it. That has to be our place as born-again Christians. Lord, I can't see into my heart. I'm not real sure because why? But we deceive ourselves. Our flesh deceives us about our own hearts. But the question is, has your heart been circumcised by the Lord, circumcision without hands, and the circumcision was to cut off the flesh, the worldliness out of your heart? Otherwise, if somebody 
put you in the wilderness, no water, no bread, what would come out of you? Sometimes, if you just, you know, for, for us men, I'll just put it this way. If you hit your finger wrong, what comes out? Oh, praise God! Oh, maybe. <laughs> what's in your heart comes out. You understand what's in there. Now, there's been a couple times that I've jerked the car just wrong at the wrong time or something, and Joan was just in that half-asleep stage, and she'll go, Oh, sweet Jesus! And then she'll look around, and everything's okay. But I know what was in her heart because that's what came out when she wasn't in control. You know I mean, that panic comes out. Who's she talking to? A Lord about me. <laughs> you know? Anyway, so I, I look at this and I go, this is real important stuff here for us to understand this. The reason he's being judged is he hasn't humbled his heart. Now in 23, he says, but you've lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. See, if your heart isn't humble, guess who is the king of your heart then? You. Okay. You've against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy contrabands have drinking wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver, gold, and brass, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. He says, and the God, capital G, in whose hand thy breath is... Oh, wait a minute. Your next breath is in his hand, and, and whose are all thy ways has thou not glorified. You should have just, along with the others, maybe thrown in, praise Yahweh, he's the God of gods. You might not be in the trouble you're in right now. Yet You get what he's saying here? Now, the thing that's kind of interesting about this, was Daniel there when he was doing all this stuff? No. How did Daniel know all this? The word of wisdom from the Lord, isn't it? The word of knowledge. Boy, you see the gifts starting to work here? Daniel wasn't in there. How would he know all that? 24, he says, Then, he says, Was the part of the hand sent from who? Him. And this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, tickle, you farson. Now, there's two ways you can you can interpret this in a weight measuring way or in a numbering way because it, it, it's it's kind of like you know you have your days have been numbered you have been weighed and found your days are numbered. he's going to give the interpretation of that but there's far more in these words remember this is a book of prophecy for Gentiles that's what Daniel was. That's why it was sealed up. It was about the, the years of Gentile reigning on this earth. And this was sealed up by Daniel, and then it was unsealed in our time. But there's, there's these, if you go by numbers here, it's really kind of, I'll, I'll get into it in a minute, hopefully. In 26, this is the interpretation of this thing. Meany, God has numbered thy kingdom. So meany, and meany, is is you if you looked at it, it it's a thousand so meany meany two thousand okay he says but god has numbered thy kingdom and finished it so it isn't just his kingdom but i want you to understand prophecy is always this way it has something to do with the immediate it usually has something to do with the near future and then with the far future when it's prophecy from God it always has three meanings and the near future usually has something to do with you well in a roundabout way I guess so does all the others you know it depends on where you're at in this timeline I guess but in 27 it says Tico he says thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting and Paris, he says, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. While he's interpreting this, the Medes are marching under the walls of the city. At this time, 
You see, this city, the reason they're throwing this party, and even though there's wars going on out there, they feel safe. Why? They're inside a, of a walled city that the walls are somewhere around 90 feet tall, 20 feet wide. They could run two chariots abreast on those walls. And then off the top of those walls, another 100 feet in the air, is the guard towers. It's, you aren't going to get over those walls. It's just, and they feel safe in there. And they have enough supplies in there for two years inside the city to feed everybody. That's stored stuff. Not only that, but the river comes under the wall, flows through the city, and out the other side, out of the wall. So they have fresh water. You can't siege this city and starve them out. You'll go home first. So they, they're having a party while the enemy's out there running around. But the enemy, remember, God is the one that's overthrowing this. God gives them a clue. You know what they do? They go up and dam up the river. They divert it. The river then goes down, riverbed, rock, dry. They march in under the walls into the city, and nobody even knows they're coming. Because, you know, when you got a city that's perfectly safe and nobody gets, everybody's asleep. People even on guard are probably asleep. And if they aren't, God has put them to sleep. Because here comes the enemy in under the walls while he's talking. He says in 29, he says, then commanded Belshazzar, he says, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, this kingdom is only going to last for about another maybe four hours. And then those that came under the wall are going to come in and put him to death and all the other rulers in the city to death and take over the city without really having shot, uh, as you would say, have fired a shot. They just take it over. So Daniel is made ruler of this kingdom for about four hours, you know. But that's okay because the next one that comes in is going to raise him right up, and he's going to be second in control of the next one. Okay, not third. Daniel went third. Okay. So you, you, what you're going to find is Daniel in many different kingdoms gets elevated up each time, higher uh, up to the second place. So in verse 30 it says, in that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. He says, and Darius, he says, the, the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. This guy is 62 years old. They came in under the wall. And, and, and Darius, Darius isn't his name. Darius is a title. Okay? And there's this, several Dariuses. But he's really taking this city for Cyrus, who's really... The, the, the one that's going to be leading of the Medes and the Persians is really Cyrus. That's another title, by the way. You know, but Darius is the one that comes in. Why is all this so interesting? Okay. Meany, meany. 1,000, 1,000. Tickle uh, is, is like, it's the same word in Hebrew would be translated shekel. Shekel is 500. That was the, the, the weight of a, of a shekel was, was 500 ounces or whatever is worth. That's its value. So it's 2,500. And, and Farsons was like that. They put the number 12 with Farsons. So 2,512. Your kingdom, this kingdom of Gentiles has been found, weighed and found wanting, and this is 2,512. This is about 500 B.C. when this is happening. So if you already take off the 500 B.C., and now you start figuring 2,012. Oh, my. Isn't that kind of interesting? It's a possibility. This is just one way of interpreting this by numbers. If you put numbers to the whole thing, maybe this prophecy has something to do with this year. We're not exactly sure when it started and when it quit, so we really don't know. But 
another 2012 years, but what year exactly? It wasn't exactly 500, but it was about, you know, it was 535, somewhere in there. Lord only knows, because no man knows the day and the hour, but I'm just telling you, there's a real pro- possibility as so many things of the Lord is coded and as so many things that just again say, we're at the end times. This is the times of the Gentiles is about up, is what he was saying to him. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? I'll ask the Lord when I get there. <laughs> if I get there, we'll get there. Okay, chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius. Now we're going to skip ahead, okay? Darius is now in control. To set over the kingdom, he says, 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. Did he get an opportunity to change all the... Who was at the party? 1,000 what? Of the other guys, the other people in controls, lords, governors, and whatever. Real easy to change all the rulers, isn't it? They're all at the party. You wipe out everybody that night. You put your new rulers in. Okay, it's really easy to do. The Lord kind of set that up for him, wasn't it? It was kind of interesting. Okay, but anyway, he's got it over the whole kingdom. And in verse 2, he says, And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. Now, isn't that interesting? He comes in, takes out everybody that has anything to do with government, except Daniel. Isn't that strange? Just really strange. He says that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Otherwise, they're the ones that's going to take control. You know, when you come in, it, this, if, if Darius was smart, he started questioning people about people. And what he found out about the records, and he looked in the records of the city and everything, is that Daniel was so faithful that even when his king was in the front yard chewing grass for seven years, Daniel just held his slot for him and waited for him to come back. Now, isn't that the kind of guy you want second in control of your household and your stuff? that wouldn't take over, wouldn't steal you blind, wouldn't turn it over to somebody else, but would be faithful. See? And he said, you know what? That's the kind of guy we need. So he made Daniel over all of them. In verse 3 it says, And this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because of an excellent spirit was in him. Now remember, I said that you're a spirit that lives inside of a body, possesses a soul. And, I, and that spirit inside, that's the heart of man, the heart. He had an excellent spirit. How, what made his excellent spirit? Way back when he was a child, Daniel purposed in his heart that he was going to serve the Lord God all of his life. If you and I come to that place where we purpose in our heart to serve the Lord God, what people will find from us is an excellent spirit because God reigns in our lives. Do you understand that? You won't defraud your neighbor. You won't covet his donkey. You know, you won't... All those things, you know, just... If, if, the, if you have an excellent spirit... Because God, Jesus Christ, reigns in your life. The question is, is he reigning in our lives? That's where we always have to keep coming back to. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego's answer to the king. King, we don't even have to think about this. We don't even have to be careful how we answer you. We're not going to serve your gods. We don't care what you do. Either way, we're free of you. You know, our God can deliver us if he chooses to do so. If not, we're out of here anyway. But we're not going to serve your gods. Is that our hearts? We're not going to walk in this world and lust after the glitter of this world. We're not going to want the shiny things in this world. We're not going to want the soft, fuzzy, warm things in this world. We're not going to, you understand, are we going to just have our hearts set on heaven and on the things God has set before us in heaven, is that our hearts? Because that's going to give us an excellent spirit. All right? Do we get that out of that? I hope. Okay, in verse 4, it says, Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. Oh, yes! 
Same thing again, isn't it? You get raised up over people, right away they're going to find some way to get rid of you. you that's going to be the thing, isn't it? Concerning the kingdom, says, but they could find no occasion. If, if God had you lifted up to be, I don't know, president of the United States or something, or second in control of the whole United States, and everybody in the United States, you know how they do they, when somebody's going to run for presidency and the media goes after them and they find all the dirt on them and the skeletons in the closets and the, could they find no occasion to bring you down? Nothing in your life? Nothing? Boy, there's a lot of men that wanted to be president wish they could have said that. They thought they had it covered up really good, but they didn't, did they? He says, but they could find no occasion nor fault for as much, he says, as he was faithful. He says, and neither was there any error or fault found in him. Wow. Who's Daniel a type and shadow of? Jesus. Okay. The Jewish man, Jesus. No fault in this man do I find, said Pilate. No fault. And he examined him pretty close with scourging. Verse 5, he says, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the laws of his God. Oh! We have to somehow, because we live in the world, we're of the world, we have to somehow trick the king into finding fault with Daniel's God. Boy, isn't that something? In verse 6, he says, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. Well, that's always good to blow a little smoke. You know, <laughs> live forever. But, but isn't it strange to, if, if it wasn't for Daniel, what would these princes be doing, these, these presidents? They'd be fighting with each other, see who's going to be ruling, right? Which one's in charge? Isn't it strange, though, when God puts someone up in, the, uh, one of his people at the top, they all can gather together against him. It's just like, you know, the, the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, and they fought continuously, hated each other, but they could all get together to fight against Jesus. See, they, they gang up together. Verse 7, it says, All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, he says, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statue. Now, a statue don't mean, I, I don't mean a, 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 a pedestal kind of statue. It's a statue like a law. And to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into a den of lions. What a stupid decree. You're going to make a law, says that? Okay. But this is probably what was happening. I'll just, I'll just do a little ad living here. Maybe it was his birthday was coming up. And they were going to honor him. And they said, okay, we're going to honor you in such a way that no one can go ask their gods or anybody but you. We're going to give you for 30 days. You're the only god around here. We're just going to honor you that way. Something, something was there. And then you talk about, you know, you may think you're pretty solid in a lot of ways. And then we're going to find this. Darius ends up regretting this, believe me. But what happens when people butter you up, they can get you. That's why a good salesman he can sell you your own car. Okay, and you'll make payments for 10 years on your own car. You know, I, a good person knows how they get in, they wiggle, they find that place inside of you. Okay, if the salesman can do that, what can the devil do? Now, he knows man's heart. Okay, he can't read your heart, but he knows man's heart. That's what just gets me so much when Paul says, nothing shall move me. Daniel, if he could think of those words, he would say, nothing shall move me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, nothing shall move us. We have decided. We have made that in our hearts. It's, it's there. It's going to stay. Anyway, they're going to make this stupid law. 30 days, nobody can ask anything of any God or anybody else or anything king and everything except for you old king you're the one and and they're going to be thrown into a den of lions in verse 8 now the den of lions is really an accurate thing and that's what they used up there that's how they, that was capital punishment 
threw him into the den of lions. He says, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it should be not changed. Because when the Medes and the Persians, you see, remember, Nebuchadnezzar, I said, he could change his mind that you, by his tongue you lived or died. And he could change his mind at any time. But the Medes and Persians had a law, a decree, once it was signed, even by the guy who signed it couldn't change it. Couldn't be changed. So that's why they're getting him, they're, they're tricking him into signing this. He says, the writing that if it not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which, was, uh, which altered not. He says, wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Once he signed it, even if he stopped and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, what have I done? It's too late. It's signed into law. Ten, he says, and don't you love it that our laws usually, if you even buy something, you got like 48 hours or three days or something like that, you can change your mind. Try and find a guy and tell him you changed your mind, though. They're hard to find for that next three days. And anyway, Tim, he says, now when Daniel, he says, knew that the writing was signed and he went to his house. He knew he, this writing was signed. He got the memo, the inner office memo, came across his computer, said, you can't ask any other God. You can't do anything. You can't do anything. What does Daniel do? He goes home to his house, opened his windows, it being opened in his chamber, he says, towards Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed and he gave thanks before God as he did aforetime. Otherwise, didn't change a thing in Daniel's life. Daniel goes, what a stupid law. Went home, as he always did, prayed three times a day with his windows open. Now, these guys just by chance happened to be walking by. Are you kidding me? They had known him. They had been probably had spies on him, had detective agencies following him around. You know, they knew all of his things, times he's going to be there, and they made sure there was a good witness there. So these, they, met, they assemble in verse 11. They fan, found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. What was Daniel? Supplication means he's asking for stuff. What would Daniel probably ask him for? Wisdom and that his people might return be forgiven of their sins and return and restore Jerusalem. That was the hearts of the Jewish people. To repent of their sins, go back and restore Jerusalem. That's probably what he's praying for. 12, he says, they came near and they spoke before the king, concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man shall, shall th that sell ask a petition of any capital G God of man without 30 days, he says, save that thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And the king answered and said, the thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which all earth not. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his, his petition three times a day. We were there all three times watching him. See, it's recorded right here on videotape. And they probably turned on their little VCR player and played him, and Daniel's there, you know, 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, now he hadn't put two and two together until he heard those words, was sore displeased with himself. Do you ever get that way? Where you've done something really stupid and you don't even know it, and then all of a sudden somebody will say something, do something, all of a sudden it just hits you like a sledgehammer right between the eyes. Oh my goodness, I did that. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. Now, Daniel set his heart on to serving the God. This king set his heart on serving unto delivering Daniel. Can this just cause you set your heart on something? Does that mean you get it? You can do it? No. You can't even serve God. Even though you set your heart on it to serve God, that's why he gave you the Holy Spirit is to <laughs> help you serve God. Do you, do you get that? Because because we're flesh. We have the nature of the sin. Okay? But you still want to set your heart. Yeah, okay. He, 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 he says he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Okay, so all day long he labored and he tried to figure out, is there any way of breaking this law? He probably had all of his lawyers in there and they were going over things. Nope, there's no way. Fifteen, then these men assembled unto the king. So they finally come in and said, you know, the day is about over and it's got to be this day. As they said unto the king, Know thou, king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree nor statute which the king established, he says, may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he says, He will deliver thee. Otherwise, I've tried, I can't, but your God can. He really come to that conclusion. You see, he figured out, I can't do it. 
Your God can. Why? He'd been going through the records. What's in the records? How that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego have been thrown into the fiery furnace and their God delivered them. Isn't that awesome? He probably said, your God can do it. He's not just a furnace God, you know. He's also a den God. Okay, 17. He says, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet. You know, probably with a wax seal and put his ring in. Then he says, The signet of his lords is that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. He says, Then the king went to his palace, and he passed the night, he says, fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He stayed up all night long, and he fasted. You know, didn't, didn't eat his little Snickers bar before bedtime and, and you know, it, nothing. And, and he, he, because why? His heart and his mind, he's probably making petition unto Daniel's God that God, that he would deliver him. Because it's a stupid thing I have done is what he's saying to God. I did this stupid thing. I've been tricked. 19, it says, then the king arose early the next morning, he says, and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out in a lamentable voice unto Daniel. He said, Daniel! <laughs> and the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Oh, Daniel, he says, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest con continually able to deliver thee from the lions? I know he can do fire, but can he do lions too? And then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. At that point, you can bet. He went, ah. Oh. He knew Daniel's voice. And he said, live forever. He says, my God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me for much as before him. Innocency, I was innocent. Innocency was found in me also before thee. Otherwise, you did it. You were tricked too. I was tricked. You were tricked, O king. He says, and he says, and have I done no hurt? Now, in Josephus it's written that the men of the palace, the, the presidents and whatever, they thought that what the king had done because he wanted to deliver Daniel so much is that he had taken all this huge supply of meat and food and threw it to the lions that they were so full, that's why Daniel wasn't eaten. That was written by Josephus in there. So the king showed him the next day. He said, Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, for Daniel, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. He says, And the king commanded that they that brought those men which accused Daniel. Now, so what the king did, according to Josephus, was this. He brought all those men and their families to it. He then brought huge amounts of food, meat, and threw down to the lions. Just like they said he had done for Daniel. Huge amount of food. To the fact that where the food hit the floor and wasn't even touched by the lions. They were so full. And they cast those men then into the den of lions and they and their children and their wives and the lions had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces and ever did but even before they came to the bottom of the den they never hit the floor so it proved the fact full lions still don't like people okay if you don't have an angel shutting their mouths these lions are vicious they are real wild animals and they ripped and tore and killed. Why their families? You know, not in looking here that this is a good thing, but I'm just going to tell you something. When it talks about when two come together, they become one, there's a whole lot of teaching in that. The spirit bonds together. They really believed that back then. Okay, 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and language, and dwelt in all the earth, and peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree. Now this is another decree going to be made. That in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the capital G, God of Daniel. Now, see, <laughs> remember I said, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Well, he's trying to put that in every other man but himself. It's Daniel's God. 
<laughs> fear you to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be ever unto the end. He delivered and rescued and he worketh signs and wonders in heavens and in earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Now that's a law. He says, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So, so Daniel is, again, a very old man, put up in the second control. How do we know that this really was true back then? They built a monument unto Daniel. It's a huge pinnacle monument. It's still there today, though you can't get in there because it's in battle area or whatever else. But Josephus wrote about it in his time. He said, and it's like it was just built yesterday. They really took care of it. Daniel was buried in that monument. It's interesting. The God of Daniel. Did it last very long? Did it make any more difference? No. You see, you can have God up here, and it just won't last. You have to put him in here to make him last. And that's the hard part. Is How do you get that? The longest trip you'll ever make in your life is 18 inches. From your head to your heart. How do you do that? You can't. Only the Holy Spirit can. But you must make the decision up here. You change your mind, God will change your heart. You don't change your mind, God won't change your heart. It's just that simple. But how you change your mind makes a difference. God, I don't want to go to hell, so come on in. Probably not going to work, is it? That's called fire insurance. Okay? <laughs> But God, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. There's no other way in the world of getting salvation other than what your son has done for me. I ask you, please, Lord God, let your son's Holy Spirit come in inside of me and forgive me for the sins I've done and let his Holy Spirit reign in my life forever. What's probably going to happen? Probably you're going to become born again. Okay? Well, Chapter 7 starts a whole nother thing. And so we're out of time, and I'm glad, so we'll get there next week. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Father, I just love these stories. And Lord, let us not think these are just fables. These have really happened. You're really there. We praise you and thank you. And these prophecies, Lord, show us what you've done with them and how we can use them in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay.